Hello there. Welcome to TypeScript plus React equals love. You know, actually, I kind of wish I had used the fire emoji instead because that's how awesome I think this partnership is. But I'll stick with the heart emoji for now. So TSConf is intended to be framework agnostic where, you know, we get to learn all the nitty gritty details about TypeScript but the conference organizers still felt that this content that I'm gonna share would be valuable. So they asked me to do a deep dive into React plus TypeScript. And I am super excited to share it with you. So hopefully you're just as excited. Uh, before we get started, I wanna let you know that the slides are available online. If you go to my website, benmvp.com and go to the speak page, you'll see a link to the slides there or you can type in the bit.ly link that you see at the bottom of your screen and it'll take you directly to the slides as well. Uh, I like to include lots of links in my slides, so you definitely wanna grab them because there will be many resources that you can go off and learn more things about TypeScript and React. So I hear people ask, why do I need to learn TypeScript when I'm already productive with JavaScript? Uh, especially because there will be a somewhat steep learning curve, uh, learning TypeScript. But I argue, you know, it's a matter of perspective. You know, why do people who are productive in making apps with jQuery decide to learn something like React? They'll find themselves struggling to do things in React that they could already do in jQuery, like manipulating the DOM, for instance. They'll be fighting with React, so to speak, instead of actually building the app in the beginning. But once they you know, pass that learning curve, they'll be able to build bigger and more sophisticated apps. And you know, like, less likely, uh, likely less buggy apps too, because they're not maintaining the state in the DOM, triggered by events and other things that created jQuery spaghetti. You see, the early struggle is because they already knew how to do web development in jQuery. If they had learned web development from the beginning with React, that sense of, is this necessary, likely wouldn't be there. It's the same for JavaScript versus TypeScript. Because you already know how to build React apps in JavaScript, jumping to TypeScript may not seem worth it. But if you were learning TypeScript from the very beginning, your perspective would be different. I argue. So most talks that talk about Re React and TypeScript just teach how to use TypeScript with React. They're assuming you already wanna use TypeScript and you just want to know the details. But whenever we're talking about non-end user features, such as a coding language, for instance, we need to ask ourselves, what exactly is the benefit? Like, does this even matter? Because if it's not a feature for the end user, then it needs to be a feature for the developer so that they can build faster, better, or more reliably for the end user. Otherwise, we're just gonna find ourselves bike shedding and arguing all the time. You see, Kent C. Dodds wrote a blog post that says exactly that, and I've linked to it here. We need to measure the success based upon how well we can deliver what the user wants. So our choice of tooling should be based upon that goal and no more. So users definitely don't want a buggy experience. And of course, neither do we, because we want them to convert on whatever it is that they're doing. But most errors I found don't actually occur when we're writing the code initially, but usually after we're making changes like refactoring or cleaning things up or figuring out how to do it. So this can be two minutes after, or this can be two months later when we come back to the code. That's when most of the bugs get introduced. And we have common errors or classes of bugs like undefined is not an object, variable X is not a function, and then there are changing interfaces like we deprecate methods or we change the types of parameters on functions. So what I wanna do I'm going to spend the rest of our time showing uh, TypeScript features that can prevent these types of bugs, specifically in React applications.
but I also want to show, at least in the beginning, how you can prevent these errors without writing much TypeScript, actually. So there's a lot that TypeScript can do, which of course is the purpose of this entire conference, but uh, I'm gonna focus on just TypeScript in the React world. So as a heads up, I'm going to assume that you've done developed in React before, but I'm gonna assume that you know very little TypeScript, okay? So even if you do know lots of TypeScript, you're gonna to get tons out of this, but for those that don't know TypeScript, I'll be explaining the concepts as we go. So to formally introduce myself, my name is Ben Alegbadu. I am a Christian, a husband, and a father. Here's my family right here picture. This is my wife, Rashida. We've been married 10 years, just celebrated our 10 year anniversary at the beginning of September. Uh, it's our do oldest daughter, Simone. She is six and a half. Our middle daughter, Avery, next to me, cheek to cheek. She just turned four in September. And then our son, Asher, he is a year and a half. And we're still working on him on smiling in photos. Anyway, we uh, live in the San Francisco Bay Area in a small town called Pittsburgh, California. It's in the Far East Bay, as I call it. And it's Pittsburgh without an H. So not Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, California. I'm also a Google developer expert and a Microsoft MVP, both in web technologies. For work, I am a principal front end engineer at Stitch Fix. For those who hadn't heard of Stitch Fix, it's an online personal styling service. So it combines technology and data science with an actual human stylist. So we try to take the effort out of shopping by providing a selection of clothes that are just picked for you. And they're sent to your door on a frequency that you choose. So we're hiring in engineering actually, and our headquarters is in San Francisco, but we have a thriving remote culture. Over half of the engineers were remote even before uh, COVID hit. So they're all over the country. So wherever you live in the United States, um, there's an opportunity for you. So go and visit the careers page. Also, I periodically host a series of short three hour remote workshops on React and I call them mini shops. So in fact, one of them is called TypeScript for React Developers. So if you're interested in getting kind of hands-on learning of using TypeScript with React in a workshop with exercises and such, you should definitely check it out. Uh, uh, you can visit my website, benmvp.com, and I have a mini shops section where all of these are listed. So we've got the TypeScript for React developers, we've got Zero to React with Hooks, which is basically an intro to React with Hooks, migrating to React Hooks, from React classes. So if you need to make that transition over, and then a new one called Sharing React Component Logic, which talks about custom hooks, render props, HOCs, all of those type of goodies for sharing component logic. So I'm doing something special for TSCon. Okay, I'm gonna do, I'm doing a free giveaway for all of the conference attendees. So if you visit my site, like I said, benmvp.com, go to the mini shops page, find one of the mini shops that you like, maybe the, the TypeScript for React developers, and see if the timing works for you. Then send out a tweet with a link to that mini shop and make sure you tag me in, benmvp on Twitter, okay? So if you tweet it out, link with the link, tag me in, I will pick one of those uh, tweets and give that person a free ticket to the mini shop, okay? So bonus points though, if you can include a selfie of you watching this very talk, okay? So if you're interested in that, go ahead and do that. But enough about me, let's dive into React with TypeScript or TypeScript with React however you wanna put it. So one thing I wanna make clear as we're just getting started is that a React component is just a function. 
There's nothing really special about it. It's just something that takes props, an object, and returns JSX, the return value. It can be treated and typed like any other TypeScript function. So just for clarity to start us off, you, you can use an interface to define the props. So here I have interface at props. And this becomes the type of the props argument in the function. So you see props colon app props. So you can name the interface anything you want. I chose app props for clarity, just to show that it could be anything, but I generally just name it props. And you can also define class components with TypeScript, but I'm only going to show functions throughout this talk. Hooks are the future. So we should be moving that way anyway. So first, I want to talk about typing props in TypeScript. Number one, with TypeScript, props cannot be used without a component in a component without a definition. So here I'm trying to use props.loading, but you know what? It's not defined in app props. Only message is defined there. So I can't use it. I'll get an error saying loading does not exist on the interface. How many times have you tried, have you had props in a component used without a prop types definition, right? It's just code in there. Maybe it's in the prop types. Maybe it's not. Maybe there are no prop types defined at all. Uh, there are ESLint rules to catch this sort of things, but they can be pretty uh, limited, you know? And similarly, you can't pass a prop if it hasn't been defined in the props as well. So, okay, how many times have you seen a prop being passed to a component and it's not defined in the prop types and it doesn't seem to be used in the code either? So you, you would think you could remove it, the call to it, but you're afraid to remove the call because you're not quite sure. Well, TypeScript gives you confidence because it wouldn't allow it in the first place if that wasn't defined. So here we have, we're passing count as a prop, but count does not actually exist on type intrinsic, intrinsic attributes and app props. So the error message can be a bit quite cryptic, to be honest, like, but it's something that as you get used to it and get more familiar with it, then it feels less weird, but I'll also give you some hints later on how uh, to decode the error messages. Okay, second props uh, suggestion or benefit, I should say. React prop types, you know, the ones that are packaged with React or the prop types package are optional by default. So I'll see a lot of examples where prop types are defined, but none of them are marked with is required, right? Uh, but it's clear that in the code, those props are definitely required. Like you have an array that's doing dot map or a string that's doing starts with or whatever the case may be. Like these are bugs waiting to happen. Well, the TypeScript interface, as we hear, as you have here, app props, um, all the properties within it are required by default. So when you list them, you're saying this has to be there by de default. So you don't have to do anything special. You're guaranteed that that value will exist. It's pretty nice, right? Um, so if you call that component and you leave off a required prop, for instance, count is left off here, it will yell and it will not compile. So here it tells me prop property count is missing on the type and names string array, which is what I'm passing in, but it's required on app props. So you get this clarity. Um, there's no confusion and you can't do things that you're not supposed to be able to do. However, you can use the question mark to denote that a prop is optional. So that means that, of course, that the value is undefined when it's not pressed, passed, that is. So count, question mark, means that it can be a number or 
undefined. So you can use object destructoring plus defaulting, as we see in the definition of app, in order to replace default props. So now if I omit count uh, when rendering the app component, there's no error because it'll default to two. And that is its default. So this is typically how TypeScript React functions look. They, you may use arrow functions, normal functions, but it's always kind of this object destructuring with defaulting in order to handle the required and non-required optional props. All right, the third one. How about those times where you've changed the type of a prop? Like maybe ID going from number to string and you do search and replace and you fix all the places that you find, but did you get them all? How can you be 100% sure, right? And TypeScript, all those places must be updated. Otherwise, you would get this error, that number is not assigned, assigned to string. So it catches these things for you. If you change the name of a prop, all the places that are using it must uh, be updated as well. So let's say the prop was originally named names and I changed it to players, but I forgot to change this place here that we see. TypeScript will complain. A derivative of this is if you mistype a prop, like you just added an extra S or left off an E or whatever the case is, TypeScript will complain immediately and say, hey, property names does not exist on type app props. So it catches these things for you. Refactors are safer now with TypeScript. Okay, fourth one. Typically, if we're um, getting data from the API, it's deeply nested data. And without prop types, it's this huge object of undocumented properties and nested properties and arrays and objects. You don't know what type anything is, right? This example of the user prop that has addresses on it and shipping on it. Well, we try to put in lint rules to force definition of object types, right? So we'll do prop types that object or even slightly better prop types that shape, but we'll pass an empty object to the shape just to get past the lint rule because we're lazy. It's uh, a lot of work to define a deeply nested shape. And then it quickly gets out of date when stuff is added, removed, refactored, and what have you. The API changes. And since there's like no enforcement that it's kept fully up to date, uh, people just don't want to do it at all. And ESLint can only, you know, it can only do so much. Well, TypeScript is now going to step in your way and prevent you from being lazy. But it's actually also saving you because you have to define exactly what's available. You can't access a property off the user prop until you define what those properties are. So in this example, we have the address interface, right? And in fact, this address interface could be in a separate file that's shared among different places because address shape is the same everywhere. So if we decide to rename is primary to primary and address, we'll get a TS or a TypeScript error in our app component because we're still referencing it as is primary. So somewhere far away from the address, we'll still catch that change and fail. So TypeScript is very beneficial in these types of refactors. In fact, after using TypeScript, you and having to go to a code base that doesn't use TypeScript, you will, won't feel as secure making these changes because of all the things that it saves you from. Okay, so that was the fourth one. Let's talk about the fifth one, which is probably my favorite one. So with React prop types, all you get is prop types dot func. Yeah, you can make it required or not, but you can't define the interface of the function. There's nothing that tells the user or the developer of the um, that's using the component what parameters it'll pass on change once when it's called, or if it expects a return value 
um, when it's handled. And now with TypeScript though, you have to define both the R arguments as well as the return value. So, you know, typical, typically callback functions don't have return values, so it's void. But in certain cases you may, and we'll talk about one coming up soon. Uh, but once again, if we decide to add a second parameter to onChange, let's say, or we decide to change the type of new value, TypeScript will error out unless we fix all of the places. And I mean all of the places because of how all the types are passed around. So how many times have you forgotten to change a function handler in some places, right? You catch most of them, but you forget these other places because of the way things have been passed around. And because these callbacks are typically call called as a result of user interaction, it's more difficult to catch those things as you're just developing locally and manually testing. You know, you have to get into a certain situation for the callback to be called. So now, in order to catch that you made this change to the function, you're relying on great test coverage. And you know how that goes, right? So TypeScript is great. Um, by the way, speaking of um, functions, it's also great for render props. So you get to see everything that the render prop is passing you. In this case, we have the children render prop and it's taking a user object and returns back React UI. It's defined right there in the children prop. And the use now of this users list component will be fully type safe. So I'll be able to reference properties on the user object that's passed in my render prop and render out however is needed. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about lists um, coming up a little later, but uh, this is a nice uh, start to it to see what we can do. Okay, so now number six on props. REST props are also typed, as we can see in this code. We typically use REST props as this kind of as this kind of kitchen sink hole for pass through props. Like, I don't know what I'm getting, but I just want to pass all these things down to this element or this component. But, you know, since we're defining the full interface of all the props that this button component can take, TypeScript knows exactly what those props can be. So even though we've pulled out type and left everything else in button props, it knows that button props will be disabled on click and children in this example. So as long as the types match with the underlying element or component, in this case, the button element, we can spread all of those props onward without a problem. So we can still kind of write the code as we're used to, but it's type safe now. Imagine that. But here's one thing though, we still can't pass whatever props we want through even though we're using the rest uh, props. Like, we know that the underlying button accepts a title prop, but the button component still has to define that its props accept title, even though we're passing those things through. So this will still fail. It'll say that title does not exist on props because we haven't defined it. However, we'll talk uh, about a way later in the and some advanced patterns that we'll look at with props. All right, number seven of props with TypeScript. We just keep going. Visual Studio Code, this integration for TypeScript is amazing. Like Visual Studio Code, if you don't know, is this free open source code editor that runs on basically all platforms as far as I know. And it auto-completes as you type. It's amazing. They call it IntelliSense, but it's basically auto-completion. And it shows uh, errors in line without having to leave your editor, which I'll, we'll see in a second. And it basically just shortens the feedback loop because it gives you feedback as you're typing. Um, I couldn't imagine writing TypeScript without VS Code. So let's look at some examples, right? So 
first, it provides auto completion for prop names. So here I have my my component component, and as I type space, then it says, "Hey, here are all the props that my component supports," and it even indicates which props are optional or not because with the question mark there, right? So I know I have to specify children, but other than that, like I can leave the rest of them out because they have the question mark. Oh, and notice the key prop right there at the bottom, the fifth suggestion. The key prop is always a valid prop. It's optional, but it's always a valid prop that can be passed to components and elements, right? Because it's used for iterations and such. So it shows up in the list, even though the component didn't define it itself. Pretty cool. Okay, so prop names, how about prop values? It also auto-completes those. So especially it's great for enums or unions uh, or booleans, right? So here we have the a status prop and it's an enum or union of failed and success. Those are the only two strings you could pass. So it auto-completes that for us. It even auto-completes object property values. So I have this item um, object and it's deeply nested. And just like the user object we were seeing before, and once I press dot, then it shows me all the properties that are on the item. And I can type that in and then uh, if I typed in ID, and let's say ID is a string, well, I could say item.id dot, and it'll autocomplete all of the methods that strings have. Or if it was an array, it'll autocomplete all of the methods for an array. All as I'm typing, I'm getting all of this feedback. So um, I don't even really need to know now all the methods that exist on objects, even the JavaScript objects, because it autocompletes for me. It's pretty nice. And um, like I said, it shows uh, errors in line as well for everything on hover, right? So in this case, name is not an actual prop, prop for my component. So I hover over it, the red squiggly, and it tells me this in the error message. So I can usually catch type errors before I even go to the app. I don't even bother going to the app. I'm just typing and I see, oh, error, what's this? Oh, okay this changed or I can't name it this or whatever the error is. Um, so, you know, I've shown these screenshots, right? But I really can't do the developer experience justice with these screenshots. Like you have to see it live. You have to play with it yourself to really get a sense of what it does for you, right? You could see these things and be like, oh, okay, yeah, but no, it is, it's, it's a game changer, right? Like I've converted over many Vim users who want to use TypeScript to using VS Code because the integration is just so great. And now they use VS Code. It's wonderful. So you may be thinking as we wrap up this topic of props, like, but React already has prop types, right? Those validations, prop types that string, prop types that number. So what exactly is the difference between what I'm getting with TypeScript with prop types? Well, prop types are runtime checks. So you either have to render the component locally in your dev environment, or you have to render it as part of a test. And uh, in the test environment, you have to catch that, oh, when this warning happens, uh, it should be a failure of the test or in your development environment, you have to be conscientious and see in your uh, developer console, if it's open, that this prop type warning happened and then um, go and fix it. The thing is sometimes the prop type warnings don't result in anything breaking, at least not on the surface. It could be a certain edge case where things would break, uh, but it's the responsibility of the developer to go in and make those fixes. The, other hand is TypeScript is compile time. So the app won't even run if there are errors, like it prevents it from running. So it's forcing you to make those fixes. Like there are ways around it. You can change your setup, so that's not the case, but, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but let's just say it prevents your app from running. So it's getting in your way, which can be really, really annoying. 
from at the start. Like if you're not used to this, you're like, wait a second, I know what I'm doing. TypeScript, please just let me know. But it gets in your way. Uh, but we can see from all of these examples that we've gone through, seven examples, uh, that it solves and prevents many types of bugs that we always run into. And we'll see even more of them in a second. So that was props. Let's jump into uh, another section. So the biggest unique difference between TypeScript, with TypeScript and React, is the props. Like, it's the props that make, uh, that's really special about TypeScript with React. Because props are the thing that's most unique with React, you know? Um, and for React function components, everything I just described is basically standard for typing functions, you know? Use an interface if your function takes an argument that's an object uh, and so forth. Uh, it's just that these functions that we've been describing just happen to be React components and return JSX. Therefore, the error are shown in JSX. But the rest of the React is really just regular TypeScript versus JavaScript. Like, it's just that migration over. So let's talk about some hooks. Let's just go on. Okay, so our props are now fully TypeScript, type-safed, because we've done everything we just talked about. So it's important for our state to be type safe too, um, because typically our state gets in, ends up getting passed as props to the next component, right? We want everything to be type safe. So generally, you don't need to do anything special when typing use state, the use state hook. It can, if, in, it can in, infer the type of count, the count state for, in this case, from the initial value. So because we passed in zero, and zero is a number, it infers that count should be a number. This is what's called type inference. And TypeScript makes a, um, great use of it, and you can make great use of it as well, so that you don't have to write them that many types. So the set count function, the setter, um, is defined to now accept a number as its parameter that's passed to it, all because of that initial zero that you passed in. So I can't accidentally pass in a string or a Boolean or anything else. So actually here I am using an updater function, not passing in a, a number because the next value of count depends on the previous value of count. So I have to use this updater function. This has nothing to do with TypeScript. This is just React. So here's a free nugget of information for you. Um, but even the updater function is typed such that prev count, that um, parameter, will be a number. The value that I return back from the updater function has to be a number, right? So everything is fully type safe. No accidents um, happening here. So if I pass anything that's not a number, or I try to do non-numeric operations on the variables, I'll get an error, of course. But take a, take a look at this code, right? There is no TypeScript here. There are no types here, yet it's fully type safe. So we get that type safety, little error in the cases where we do the wrong thing, but we didn't even have to write any TypeScript. That's pretty cool. And the great part is that we can pass around that setter, in this case, you know, set value. We can pass that around to other props that take callback functions as well. And as long as the types match, it just works, right? So we have this input component, it has an on change, and that on change is going to, uh, it'll call on change with a string when the input changes. And guess what? Set value is a function that takes a string that will set the value. So we're guaranteed that the child component input will pass the right type when it calls on the on change handler because the types match. We can pass down setters without having any worry that they're uh, doing the right thing. So, however, 
if the initial value is null, you'll need to declare the type of the state. You're in the same situation if the initial value is um, an enum, for instance. So if it's one value of the enum, you're gonna have to specify that the actual type of the state is an enum, not just this one string. So <clears throat> we specify the type of the state using this angle bracket syntax for generics. So what it's saying is that you, it's saying use state angle bracket brackets user pipe null, which means that the type can be either a user object or null. We're initializing it to null, and then after we get the API data down below in the use effect, we're gonna set it to a user object. So if you're unfamiliar with generics, I included a, a link to this great video from uh, Harry Wolf. He has lots of great videos actually about JavaScript and React and uh, TypeScript and all kinds of web dev related things. Uh, so this video should hopefully kind of get you, give you a jump start on how generics work and what exactly they are. Okay, so we were actually, you know, we were looking at this use effect, talking about this use effect right now. Let's just go ahead and jump into use effect, the second hook I want to talk about. So there's not too much to type with use effect, actually, uh, since it just takes in um, a function, but it does ensure that you only return a cleanup function, as you can see here. So um, this example is actually almost similar to the example from before. It looks the same except for the parentheses. This one has an implicit return with parentheses where the other one had curly braces, which wasn't returning anything. So as a result of this implicit return, we're actually implicitly returning a promise, which you may not notice from the code, but TypeScript knows. So we'll get a compilation error um, that you see at the bottom that says, whoa, promise void provides no match for what should be returned, which is either a function that returns void or undefined, i.e. not returning anything. So the thing is, this one is super important. So React will even warn you about this at runtime. And there are ESLint rules to catch this, but it's nice that uh, TypeScript can catch it pretty much first. All right, so we talked about use state, we talked about use effect. Let's mm, settle in and let's talk about uh, use reducer because it, it, it has some typing going on to make it all work. So for those who don't know, a reducer function uh, takes in the current state plus an action and returns new state, as we'll see in a second. So we first need to define the types of our state and the type of our actions. So the state is defined here. It has three valid statuses, which are loading, failed, and success. It has an optional items property, which can be undefined, but when the status is success, will be an array of items. And it has an optional message, which can be undefined, but when the status is failed, will be the error message. Okay? Then we have our action type, and it's what's called a discriminated union. It's basically like an enum of objects, if you want to think of it that way. So we define each action with its type property and whatever other, prop whatever other properties it needs. And then an action can only have or only be one of these shapes. So you couldn't, for instance, have an action with both an error and a payload or an action that was of type loading that had a payload. So we'll see the benefits of this right here. So in our reducer, we see that the function header or the function definition takes in the state, a parameter called state, which is of type capital state, and an action, which is of type capital action, and returns new state, which is the colon after there. 
in our arrow function. So TypeScript knows what the valid types are of the actions based upon the discriminated union we had. So it knows that action.type is either a loading, is either loading string, failed, or success. So it will actually auto-complete those strings as I write case statements in the switch statement, which is pretty nice. And it will uh, also uh, knows that for the loading type, as we see here, the, there are no other properties that the action can include, uh, or there are no other properties on the action, that is. So there's no act, when it, the case is loading, action doesn't have any other properties. So I can't even do action dot payload, for instance, in this case, because we said that the type was loading. And in that case, there are no other properties. Uh, but for the failed type, it does have an error property, action.error. And we can use that to then update the state to set that message. Similarly, for the action.type, when it's success, their action also has a payload property with it. And I can access it th that. So it's actually, TypeScript is actually restricting what I can access off of the action parameter based upon what the action type is. So uh, I can't make any kind of mistakes that way. It'll throw errors. And TypeScript also knows that I've handled all the cases of the action that type. So I really don't even need a default case, but you know, I could throw an error in the default case. Yeah. So uh, in fact, you know what? We use the discriminating union for the action. We could actually use a discriminating union for the state as well. Uh, and in this way, um, the items, for instance, will only exist when the status is success. And the message will only exist when the status is failed. Because before, you know, we were making those as as associations, but it was not enforced. But now it is enforced. The state can only have a uh, items property when the status is success, which will be useful in the UI. So this ensures that we don't get any, into any odd states. Um, you know, where we're in status success and there's both an error message as well as the data. So up until this point, you know, we haven't actually done any React. This has all just been JavaScript. We're going to be using this reducer function in React, but you know, this is all just typing, TypeScript, JavaScript, normal uh, stuff. But let's now finally jump into the hook. So the use reducer hook looks at the, the type of the value returned by the reducer that's passed to it. So the reducer returns a type of capital state, if you remember, right, the new state. So it uses that to determine that the variable state here is of type state. And it also validates that the shape of the initial state we're passing, you know, status loading, is an actual valid combination of states, which is pretty cool. So I, I, once again, I couldn't add items to status loading because that's not a valid um, discriminating union option. And then the dispatch can only take valid action types um, from the action discriminating union. So once again, if I try to, to add uh, payload to type failed, for instance, it'll be a TypeScript error. Um, so below all this code, below the use effect, below the use reducer, I would actually you know, render out the UI and that's where I would use the state variable. But in order to access state.items to render out the items, I would first have to check that state.status was success. Or in order to render out the error message, I first have to check that a state.status um, was failed. So 
those associations are forced. Like I can't get into these weird cases. I can't access state that items if I'm not, I have not told TypeScript that yes, I'm in the state where state dot status is success. So um, as you can see, there are lots of moving parts that work together with use reducer, right? You have the state definition, the action definition, the reducer, use reducer, um, all of these different things, your dispatches. So now imagine adding or changing an action, right? Or what if you just like mistyped a property in the state? TypeScript will catch all of this. Whereas without it, like who knows how long it'll take you to find this bug. You'll be pulling out your hair and become bald like I am, right? Uh, this all happened because TypeScript didn't exist. <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's move on to uh, the last one of hooks, which is custom hooks, right? So custom hooks really are regular functions. React does some special things with them, but from the looks of them, they're regular functions. So you type them just like any TypeScript function. So there's nothing really special to say about them, except that we tend to, um, it's a common practice with custom hooks to return a tuple. And a tuple in JavaScript, I'm defining as this array of two elements, maybe three elements, but typically it's two elements. Because once you get to three or four elements, you're just going to return an object instead. But um, in this case, though, when you're returning a tuple, you want to use an as const assertion. So otherwise, the, the type inference that TypeScript does will incorrectly guess the type. So I have a link here to more on const assertions. But basically, what happens is we are returning a two element array, right? The first element is the user object, and the second element is a function that takes a string and returns void. Basically, the username set function. So by default, TypeScript will infer that this, that what we're returning is an array of strings or functions. So without the as const, it'll think that, okay, the return type is an array of strings or functions. It, the array can be however many long, and there can be a string or function in any element, right? But what we want specifically is that the first element is a user object, the second element is the function, right? Because we're gonna be doing that de array destructuring like we do with use state all the time, where the first element is one, the second element is another, and our types will be all messed up as a result. So with the const assertion in place, we'll get all the similar type safety that we get um, when we call use state. So that's just a trick. There are other ways to solve that same problem, but this one's nice and short, and I really like it. <sighs> okay. Wow, you know, things were starting to get more advanced towards the end there with as, const assertions and the reducer things. Um, and as you're seeing kind of as things get more complex, we're less able to rely on type and TypeScript inference, right? Um, we have to be a bit more explicit about what we're trying to do. But the nice thing though, is that when we do that, TypeScript can protect us from ourselves. So what I wanna do now is I wanna return back to discussing props. But now talk about some advanced patterns with props that can be super helpful that you may find yourself using. They of course require writing more TypeScript types. So, you know, let's jump in. So sometimes, right, you have a component with dependent props. So in this example, we have the text component that allows you to truncate the text somehow with the truncate prop. And it's true or false. Truncate, yes, truncate, no. It also has a show expand prop that, let's say, 
let's say provides a link to that you can click on to expand the truncated text, right? So the show expand prop doesn't really make sense without the truncate prop. Like there's nothing to expand if it's not, hasn't been truncated. So if you provide the sh show expand prop and don't provide the truncate prop or set it to false, that should be an error, right? And we can write all kinds of code to make sure that that case doesn't exist or you know fail somehow. But it's a much better developer experience for users of the text com component if they can get a TypeScript error, right? Something that prevents them from actually doing it and gives them feedback. So we want basically for these invalid configurations for them to get this error message that it's uh, telling them that they're doing it wrong. So how do we make that happen? Well, there are a couple of ways that we can set this up. Um, this is my preferred approach and it's worked well for me, so I'm going to share it with you. So first at the top, you will have um, what I'm calling your common props. So these are all of the props that will always exist, right? So they're not dependent on one another, they're just there. So in this case, it's the children prop that's a React node. Okay, then second, you'll have what I'm calling the truncate props, which is another discriminated union. These are coming up quite often, actually. So the first part of the dis discriminated union is when the truncate prop is false, right? Or not defined, undefined, not specified. In this case, right, when it's false, unspecified, undefined, we set show expanded to undefined itself, which basically means that you cannot set truncate, you cannot set show expanded when truncate is false or undefined. Like there's no other values that are available except undefined, which means not specified. Okay, then the second half of the discriminated union is when the truncate prop is true when it's actually turned on and only true, like this is the only option for it. In that case, then show expanded is an optional Boolean. So we could not specify it, we could specify it as false, we could specify it as true. And we're now allowed to make this extra configuration about whether or not that link should show up. So the props in this case, the type props is an intersection or a combination of common props and truncate props. That and is called uh, an intersection, technically. But I just think of it, oh, it's merging those things together and giving me all the props, all the types from it. And then lastly, in the code, what you'll get is that truncate, props.truncate and props.showExpand are optional Booleans. This is why I like this approach because it doesn't involve having to do jump through any other hoops. You just get optional Booleans there. So, um, and you don't have, so this is kind of like how you would write it normally just as optional Booleans. But in this case, you don't have to guard against the situation where show expanded is true, but truncate is false because TypeScript prevents that situation from happening. We're getting those errors. So, Perfect. Okay, oh, oh, quick tip on understanding TypeScript errors. I promised that I would share this with you um, earlier. So as you create more advanced and more sophisticated types for these complex situations, your error messages are gonna be, get more complicated to read. Like, I'm just forewarning you, being truthful, being upfront. So this is actually the full error when uh, truncate is set to false, yet you set show expanded to true. Like the case, the invalid case that we were trying to prevent with our code. So what I found is easiest is to read the errors from bottom to top. So you keep reading until you get enough information to understand exactly what the problem is and you can debug and figure it out. So I was going to actually, I was gonna add some spacing 
in this error message to try to make it a bit easier to read, but like, this is literally what it looks like. So I shouldn't try to sugarcoat it. Like, this is the error message and all it's blobbly text. So let's try to uh, parse this thing. So we start at the bottom, like I said, it says type false is not assignable to true which is probably not enough information to figure out what's going on. So let's go up one level. And it says types of property truncate are incompatible. Okay, we know truncate is a Boolean, so false is not true. Maybe I'm passing false when I should be passing true. Okay, maybe I could understand what is going on, but let's pretend that this is not enough information. So I would go up one frame again, where it says type children of element, truncate of false, show expanded of true, is an assignable to truncate of true, show expanded of Boolean undefined. Okay, so that first part, children of element, truncate of false, show expanded of true, is what we wrote in our JSX. So we pass some children, we specified truncate as false, or maybe didn't specify it at all, but we specified show expanded as true. The second half, the truncate true, show expanded Boolean undefined, is what TypeScript expected the type to be. It's the part of the discriminated union that matches, or closely matches, right? It expected show expanded, it said if show expanded is going to be true, truncate needs to be true too, basically. That's the match. So with these errors, as you try to read them, as you go um, up the error stack, so to speak, error message stack, let's call it, you have fuller context of what's going on, but it can be super confusing. Like I don't even wanna try to read the top of the frame, and in fact, you can see it has dot, dot, dots because there's uh, so much text going on there. But as you go lower, errors get more micro and specific, easier to read, but you lose context. So you'll likely need multiple frames to successfully debug exactly what's going on. Okay, so that was one advanced pattern. Let's take a look at another one, right? So I'm calling this extending HTML components. So if you remember back in the beginning, we had our button component that was doing the kitchen sink uh, render props, right? Uh, not render prop, rest props, and passing it to an underlying HTML button. Remember that? Uh, so we have some custom props, I guess I'll call them. Uh, variant in size, they control the visual design of our button component, but really it's just a wrapper around the button element. So everything else I pass to it, I want it to go directly into the button element, right? But I want it to be tight, right? I just want it to be this junk drawer of stuff that gets passed through and I don't know if I can or am able to pass it through. Like I want it to let me know that I can press pass type and what values I can pass for type for button. I want it to let me know that if I specify href for whatever reason on the button component, that that is not allowed and it should fail. So there's no validation that happens with vanilla J, um, JavaScript. I could pass that href and it'll be fine. I'd be, well, I'd be relying on the runtime error of React to tell me that that's invalid. So how do we go about making this type safe element wrapper? Uh, well, there are multiple ways to accomplish this again, but here is one way. Uh, so first you define whatever are these new properties that you're adding to your component. So like I said, variant, which can be primary or secondary, you know, uh, these are like the style or background of the button, let's say, and then size, which can be default, small, or large. There you go. Uh, and then Next, we want to define the props type as the intersection or the combination of those new props that are defined, as well as all of the props that exist on the button element. So react.componentProps 
generic angle brackets button element. But uh, there may be a chance that the button element already has variant or size props in them. And if we try to merge in um, our new props, let's say there was size in both. If you try to merge in our size with the one that already exists on the button element size, weird things happen with TypeScript that I don't quite yet understand why. So we want what we want is all of the props of the button element except for the new ones we're defining, right? So we want to remove those properties before we do the intersection. So we get we use key of um, to get all of the props of new props. So that will be variant in size. And then we use the omit utility type to remove those from the list of props that come from button elements, right? Then uh, once again, we merge those into the new props. So there will be uh, no collisions. You don't have any kind of override rules or anything like that. So that's why we use omit. So omit is a special type, generic type. Again, you see the curly braces or the angle brackets. There are a full list of maybe a dozen, 15, 20 utility types. Uh, and I have a link there so you can check those out. They're super helpful in doing various uh, things, relatively new in TypeScript. And then lastly, inside of the component, the actual implementation, we can get button props again, that spread uh, or that rest uh, parameter. It'll have, even though it looks like a junk drawer, kitchen sink of uh, props, it actually will be typed to have all the properties that a button element can have. And we can just pass those all through, spread them all through to the button element but everything is type safe. So if I did pass that href to the button component, it would try to be in button props, but it would not be valid and there'll be a TypeScript error. And the cool part is that uh, when I'm using the button component, I will still get auto completion for disable the type and all the other props that come with button. So lots of great things. Okay. Here is the last um, props setup that I wanna show you, all right? So remember back again, we were talking about the users list and it was taking uh, a render prop that had to be, uh, that took in, that got past a user object. So let's take this a step folder for further. Let's make, instead of having a users list, let's have a generic list and uh, that has a render prop. So instead of it knowing what type of items it's getting, you, it determines what item should be passed to the render prop based upon the types that are in the items that are passed to it. Because the list doesn't really care in this case about what the actual uh, items themselves are. It just wants to render them out and maybe put some dividers, spacing, et cetera, et cetera. It lets the render prop take care of what the actual UI looks like. So now list, of course, has to be able to handle various different types. So on the left side, we have items with a uh, string of uh, array of strings, ball, bat, hat. But then on the right side, we have an array of numbers, 23, 45, 62, 13. When we use the strings, we call string or item.length. So the render prop uh, gets an item. And in that case, the type of the item is a string. On the right side, the type of the item is a number. So I don't actually have to uh, write TypeScript types to say that item is a string or that item is a number. Based upon the type inference, it will know that item is a string an item as a number. That's why I can call dot length or dot two fixed on it. So we want to be able to know the type of item of the item param and the render prop uh, based upon the items. 
So you can imagine if instead items were uh, user objects, right? Uh, and then item would be a user object. We would really want this functionality to, to work because it's super flexible. We need to know what type item is. So how do we do this? Well, uh, like I said, a render prop is a special function, right? Um, it's just a special function prop, that is. So it just happens to return React. But um, we can type it just like we type regular callback functions, okay? So with the power of generics, again, it can be generically typed. So let's try to parse this out, all these angle brackets, see what's going on. So the list component itself defines a generic parameter type, T. Uh, T can be anything as well. I tend to like to use longer names. Uh, T was what could fit on the slides, but T is also the standard for a generic type. Then, T is passed to props. So now props is now parameterized or generic as well. So it takes a T. And what, are, what exactly are we using this T for? Well, the T now becomes the type of the items. So no longer is items an int, a number array, or a string array, or a user array. Instead, it is a T array. So T is parameterized. It is determined based upon what items were actually passed in. So you pass in a string array, T is a string. You pass in a number array, T is a number. You pass in a user array, T is a user object, right? So it's flexible in that way. So then T also then becomes the type of the item that is uh, passed in the render prop. So that's how we're able to get uh, that item being the type that we um, expect, which is pretty cool. So type inference um, works with generics like we, like we saw. So therefore, uh, the render prop will have the correct type. So I call this list component parameterized. It's basically a generic component, but I call it a parameterized component. So it adds more function flexibility to the component to enable all sorts of flexible use cases. And, but the key is that it's still strongly typed. So you always know what the type is. It may be different types depending on how it's used, but you always know what the type is, um, which is nice. And then uh, one thing I wanna call out is that this angle bracket T comma thing, which is kind of weird because other places we're just using angle bracket T. Well, when you're using arrow functions to define your components, as I like to do, uh, the, the angle bracket T gets confused with JSX, the parser does. So adding the comma enables the parser to understand, oh, this is a generic definition of the component as opposed to be somehow writing some JSX. So be aware of that. If you're writing your function components using the function keyword, you don't have to worry about this. Um, so just an, an FYI. So uh, generics are already a little bit confusing to use as we were using with use state but defining generics, especially generic components, can be really mind-bending, right? So, uh, but they're really, really critical or really valuable and shareable code that you want to be flexible. So I've included another link to, the, um, to help you understand generics, another resource. This is a blog post. It's called TypeScript Generics for People Who Gave Up Understanding Generics. Pretty epic title. So you read through that. I think uh, between that and the video, you should be solid on generics. Okay, so let's start uh, talking uh, about setup so we can wrap this thing and bring us home. So how do you get set up with TypeScript in your React application? 
Well, the easiest way to get set up is just to use Create React App, okay? It's always the easiest way to have a, a React application. So there is a special TypeScript template that you can use. So you say MPX, Create React App, name of your app, and then you specify the template as TypeScript, bam, you got a TypeScript app bootstrapped for you. And it gives you a basic TS config, uh, TypeScript config as well. So there's also a way to add TypeScript to an existing Create React app if you already have one running and now all of a sudden, hey, I'm trying to add TypeScript because Ben made it seem so cool. Uh, there's a way to do that too. So follow those, that link there and the docs will show you exactly how to do it. Okay, so then for non-Create React apps, it's also fairly straightforward. So in the past, you had to ditch Babel, which I'm assuming you're using um, for your React apps, and you had to use TypeScript for both JavaScript transpilation, so transpila transpiling your modern JS down to vanilla JS, I'll call it, or ES5, and you had to use TypeScript for type checking. So you had to get rid of Babel, use TypeScript for everything. TypeScript took over. But now with the latest version of Babel, um, TypeScript and Babel actually work together thanks to this package that I've listed there, the Babel preset TypeScript package. So you add that to your Babel config and that page shows you how the little configuration you have to add. And Babel now continues to handle uh, transpiling your code. Instead of transpiling just React, it's now transpiling TypeScript and React. So it works with your other presets like your, your React preset, for instance. And um, you only use the TypeScript compiler now for type checking, which I'm about to talk about right after this. Uh, Babel handles transpiling, TypeScript handles, the TypeScript compiler specifically handles type checking. So in my opinion, and it seems to be even the opinion of the TypeScript, TypeScript folks, is that Babel does a better job of transpiling, especially if you have all of these other um, plugins and presets because the ecosystem around Babel is so much bigger and you can do so many different things um, that you're, you're uh, as part of your transpilation step. It's just way more robust than TypeScript. However, TypeScript is you know, awesome at type checking. So you're still gonna need the TSE, which is a TypeScript compiler to do your type checking. Um, because, well, so bundling your app will uh, fail if your types are incorrect. But in CI, for your pull request, you probably don't want to run through the whole app building process for every push of a branch. Um, for your pull request, you want to make your checks as fast as possible. But you still want to know that your code is type safe or type correct. So you can use the TSC compiler with no emit mode turned on, and it'll just run type checking without actually generating any JavaScript files. So follow that link there and they'll show you all of the arguments that you can pass to the CLI. So you would run this command in addition to running your unit tests as well as your linting. Yeah? Okay, and then um, one other thing is that in order for you to be able to accurately type your React code, all of your dependencies need to be typed as well because you're going to be calling methods or functions or getting data and you need to know what those types are so that your code can be type safe as a result. So some of your dependencies may be written in TypeScript, which is awesome because then the TypeScript definitions will be bundled or shipped with the package. All you have to do is just import the package, good to go. But um, most or some at least of the, of the dependencies won't be written in TypeScript. For instance, React is not written in TypeScript. But that's where definitely typed comes in. It's this amazing repo of type definitions, high quality type definitions. So 
It has all of your favorite packages. It has Lodash. It has Moment. <laughs> it also has uh, React as well. So what you have to do is you um, have to add an additional dependency. So it's at types, that's the scope, slash, whatever. So at types, React, you include that dependency. Now when you import from um, the React package, you'll get all of the types. Um, as we saw with you state and et cetera. This is also, you don't have to write the type definitions yourself because you definitely don't want to do that. All right, so the one question I always get, which you may be thinking now, if you had time to kind of process as I've been flooding you with information, is do I have to switch to TypeScript all at once? Is it like an all or nothing sort of deal? And the answer is no. It is not at all. And actually, I totally advise against big rewrites. Like, again, the whole purpose, right, is to deliver a better quality app for your users. You spending weeks, if not months, rewriting TypeScript, rewriting your app in TypeScript is not providing value. And to be quite honest, the TypeScript you write in the beginning is not going to be that great. So you definitely don't want to go and make your whole app not that great. So, you know, do it progressively. Uh, I suggest taking it component by component, in fact. And with your Babel setup, like I talked about, a JavaScript component can import a TypeScript component, no problem. Like, it'll, you know, get those types but not use anything, not use them at all. But you want to try to avoid the reverse, however. So a TypeScript component that is importing a JavaScript component and calling methods or whatever, uh, rendering it, won't have any of the type information from that JavaScript component. So it won't be able to do the validation that it wants to do. So there are many schools of thought of how to handle this, but my opinion is that if you're gonna bother using TypeScript, you should just go all in, right? So be as strict as possible. Don't allow the any type, which is basically what JavaScript, all variables in JavaScript are, the any type. So you can do anything with it. Um, instead, uh, I suggest you use all the settings you can in the TypeScript config to reach the highest level of strictness. So uh, no implicit any's and um, things like that. So you can go and look at the TypeScript uh, configuration, which I'll link to you in a second, and see all of those. Uh, but I suggest starting migrating utilities or helpers first. So these are those things that have little to no dependencies, but lots of other things are using them. So you will be able to work your way outwards, basically. You want all of your dependencies to be typed. That's the ideal before you start converting whatever file it is, a component or utility, what have you. So then as a result, most likely your top level app component will be the last thing to be converted. All right, so as promised, here are more resources. So, you know, I sprinkled links throughout the slides, but there were some that I couldn't fit anywhere. Uh, so here are some additional ones for you to check out. The most useful one will likely be the first one, the React TypeScript uh, cheat sheet. It provides like all of these cool uh, recipes for common situations. Some of the ones we talked about already, other ones just to show you like, oh, here's how you do that thing in TypeScript. Uh, I also have a article on there, React prop types with TypeScript. So it shows you kind of the mapping between React prop types to their types in TypeScript. And there are uh, a ways to have, there's an ESLint plugin for TypeScript as well. So to make sure that you're doing TypeScript right, right. So there's multiple ways to do different things and it kind of, you know, shoehorns you into a certain way. And then I mentioned the tsconfig.json, all of the configurations for that. So as I mentioned way, way, way back in the beginning, um, I was only gonna talk about function components, right? Uh, but you can use uh, TypeScript with class components. Yes, it's possible. 
Uh, but like I said, hooks are the future. But if you have to type and want to type your class components, these resources have examples of how to do that. Okay, bringing this home. Uh, I know I've been super excited about TypeScript and hopefully that has shown through, right? Because it catches and prevents so many errors like I showed, probably showed two dozen of them and it solves lots of problems, but I'm a realist, okay? I'm not drinking, well, maybe I am drinking the Kool-Aid, but it's not a cure-all, all right? It's a tool just like anything else. So you know what? You still need a code review. You still need um, tests for runtime things. Like, hopefully you need less of those things, but uh, you still need those to exist. TypeScript doesn't mean that, oh, uh, it's doing everything for me, okay? And one last thing, uh, you are gonna find yourself fighting against TypeScript, hands down, no matter what, because you're going to try to write, type some code that you've written and it won't be working. You're writing this dynamic JavaScript that you're used to writing and TypeScript is complaining because it can't figure out what the types are, no matter how you try to define them. This is gonna happen, um, but remember, when you're going through that difficulty, uh, with TypeScript, you are signing up to make your code more strict. And as a result, you're not gonna be able to do everything because everything you can do in JavaScript is not type safe. So it's at this point where a certain camp of people that I'm not a part of suggest that you make your types loose. Uh, just sprinkle an any in there and keep it moving. But what's the point of that, I say? So I say stick to it being strict, which may mean you have to write your code, rewrite your code a little differently. So I want you to keep this thought in mind from Jared. He said this at React Conf three and a half years ago now, that maybe if your code is really hard to type check, the code itself is really hard. So maybe you should rewrite it. Something to think about when you're going through it. But I still think, it's totally worth it. So that's it. Oh man, I just flooded you with a whole bunch of information, right? Uh, hopefully you found it insightful, right? It's motivated to you to use TypeScript in your next or even current React project. Uh, I would love to hear feedback from you about what um, was new, what was interesting, what you want to be able to use, uh, all that sort of thing. Um, you can. Uh, reach out to me on Twitter, at BenNVP. It's there at the bottom of the, the slides there. And you can pepper me with questions as well that you have about how to do a certain thing. I'll try my best to uh, be responsive. So uh, the slides, again, are available online. So go to my website, BenNVP.com, and you will find a link there as you browse around, or again, type in this bit.ly link right there at the bottom, and it'll take you directly to the slides. All right, so uh, I want to thank TSConf, the whole team, for uh, providing me, giving me this opportunity for me to share with you all about TypeScript and React, my passion for TypeScript and React, Hopefully I was able to pass along that passion about TypeScript and React to you. And you know what? I also want to thank you for taking the time uh, to watch this. Maybe you watched it in 1.5X and I sound like a chipmunk, but you know, whatever. You still took the time to watch and listen and I greatly appreciate that. So reminder about the mini shops. You can go check those out on my website. And if you tweet out a link, and tag me in it, maybe you'll be the one that gets the free ticket to the mini shop, okay? Uh, so go forth, TypeScript and React. Thank you very much for uh, listening and watching and I hope you enjoy the conference. Bye-bye.